Uh, today, uh, the seventh annual conference um, organised by uh, the Faculty's Centre for Public Engagement. Um, and the title of the conference is uh, Power to the People. Um, uh, those of you like me old enough uh, to remember the Tooting uh, People's Popular Front, um, uh, that's a, a tooting title uh, from a, a comedy back in the day. Um, and it seems to me, um, from where I am uh, today, that um, uh, public interest and public involvement in science uh, and research, particularly in relation to health and social care, has never been more important. Uh, we're at an interesting week um, where we can now see, um, as it has been released, the uh, SAGE guidance to government, and we're in the position of understanding that the government have made a decision, presumably in the context of all the things that they have to weigh in the balance, that they're not going to follow all of the advice that they've been given. So we've all, um, since March or before, suddenly become urgent stakeholders in decisions made on the basis of scientific advice. Um, and, um, and so it's never been more important for us to think about how we, as members of the public, uh, engage with um, and uh, commission and contribute uh, to the development of that scientific advice. Um, so uh, it's quite a poignant and important moment for this conference, which has got um, a, a different spin on it because of circumstances than last year. And so it is uh, with particular pleasure that I would like to introduce uh, Jeremy Taylor OBE, uh, who um, has um, been very kind to come today and open our conference. Uh, Jeremy is Director of Public Voice at the Nan National Institute for Health Research, and he leads the Centre for Engagement and Dissemination, uh, which essentially leads the NAHR's work on partnership with the public and disseminating experience to improve health and social care practice. Uh, Jeremy was born in Leeds and studied social and political science at Cambridge University and began his career as a researcher in Scotland and then joined the civil service in 1989. Uh, he became a se se senior official in the Treasury, working on public service issues and later joined the voluntary sector. And for 10 years, up until uh, 2019, he was chief executive of National Voices, a national charity umbrella which stands up for person-centred care and, and patient and public involvement and the role of the voluntary sector in health and social care. He was awarded the OBE in 2019 in the New Year's Honours list for services to health and uh, care charities. So, uh, Mr. Taylor, thank you very, very much indeed for um, uh, doing us the courtesy of joining us today. Um, as I've outlined, uh, we're all wrapped with attention because the subject you're going to talk to us about has never been more important. And the title of your talk, which you've kindly put up for us, is Where Next for Public Involvement? And that's clearly a critical question um, in these present times. So, sir, over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Andy, and thank you uh, to the organisers for inviting me. Thank you for the for the uh, for the comprehensive introduction to me. I must remember to edit my biographical notes in future because it was far too long. Um, so, um, my current job is as director for public voice at the NIHR. Uh, I am assuming some familiarity with NIHR. Um, the, the National Institute for Health Research is actually the biggest funder, depending on how you do the measurement of health and social care research in, in the UK, both in terms of funding and providing infrastructure and facilities and training and people to support a very large uh, health, health and care research effort. Uh, um, I want to give you a bit of an overview about what we're up to in relation to public involvement, some thinking about um, um, where public involvement might be going or, or where the frontiers might be. Um, and it's a partial view because this is a double act um, with my colleague Tina Colden, who uh, provides a service user very important advice to the centre as an advisor to the centre uh, and was previously the chair of the, uh, the old involved advisory group. So together, I think we'll provide a view which uh, it'll be interesting to see to the extent to which we agree um, or contrast it, and we haven't tried to um, uh, over a line, um, but but uh, so um, uh, we'll have um, hopefully interestingly contrasting views about where next for public involvement, but not too contrasting. Um, 
just uh, a little bit about the history of our new centre. The Centre for Engagement and Dissemination is the continuation by other means um, of what was the NIHR Involved Centre with a focus on patient and public involvement in research and the old NIHR Dissemination Centre, which had a particular focus in producing evidence summaries from NIHR research and, get, and disseminating the, those out to the wider world. So those two functions have been brought together into the new centre and it's been running since the 1st of April under a new contract with the Department of Health. Uh, the NIHR is quite complicated in the way it's structured through a series of contracts, um, but these functions are the continuation of very important functions for NIHR. Um, our, our new centre is quite small. We have about 20 people um, um, in total um, and um, we have a particular role to lead and co-order the work around public involvement um, to also provide a space for innovation and creativity and to promote innovation and new ways of, of working um, and as well as being the centre director I have a role in, in being the director for public voice which gives me a sort of cross-cutting role in NIHR to support and challenge the NIHR uh, as a sort of critical framework to become more democratic and inclusive in the way it works. So our role in public involvement as a centre is, is very much to continue to um, deliver on the NIHR's commitment to involving patients and the public in the work that it does. That's a commitment that was baked in from the outset when NIHR was formed in 2006 and, and it continues to be very important. Um, many of you have been involved both as a, as a brand and as a, um, a name that was given to different organisational forms during the history of NIHR. So I, I see our centre very much as being the curators of the involved legacy in terms of providing resources and support to the wider NIHR and health uh, and care research community to ensure that public involvement can be done in a good way and and to achieve impact. Um, so that is part of updating resources. Um, it's um, partly about coordinating activities across uh, NIHR. Um, it's also working to share, to connect, to support people in different ways. And I see us also as a kind of improvement agency, um, focusing always on um, how good are we and how can we get better um, at this thing that we variously call public involvement, public engagement um, and so forth. Um, so that's our role. Um, ah, now my slides don't want to move, which is quite naughty of them. Um, just let me see what I can do about that. Um, we are. Part, part of our work in continuing the legacy of Involve is to work on the strategy um, for public involvement in NIHR research that was actually written back in 2015. And it was a 10-year strategy. It was called Going the Extra Mile. And it was essentially an improvement journey, strategy, strategic framework for, for public involvement, um, which in many ways is still current. Uh, uh, and provides quite a good strategic framework. But how we deliver on the aims in that strategy uh, is now quite different because we're living in a quite different world. Um, one of the things that came out of going the extra mile was a commitment to work in partnership to, de de uh, to develop standards for public involvement across the UK. A piece of very important work happened um, and many of you will be familiar with and probably were involved in the development of those standards. Um, so a big part of our role is to support the research system to make a reality of those standards, to use them as a guide to improving um, and entrenching public involvement uh, um, across uh, health and care research. But we do live in a very changing context for um, public involvement in research and Andy right at the start has hinted at some of the issues that have changed uh, that the way um, that people are, um, relate to uh, the world of health and care research. I want to start by talking about austerity and inequality because I think it's a huge contextual factor. Um, uh, we, we have an incredibly unequal uh, society uh, with huge inequalities in health and well-being um, and um, often it's easy to gloss over those, but they're in a very important context. And to some extent, they've been highlighted by COVID-19, um, which has done a number of things to 
highlight inequality, but also highlight some of the weaknesses in the in voting involvement. I think we'll probably talk about this later on, and it has been the subject of much discussion. Um, but in the hurry to commission lots of COVID research, the patient to public involvement kind of got sidestepped, and it's raised some important questions about the extent to which it is properly embedded and how you can do it well, even at pace. Black Lives Matter, um, the, re the resurgent interest and concern about racial inequality in particular um, is a factor that is current right now. Indeed, it has been a factor all along, but I think there's been a resurgence of concern and interest about racial inequality as part of a broader pattern of inequality. I think our sense of what this involvement business is all about has changed. I think the the overall direction of travel is towards a greater desire for democracy. It's not universally distributed, um, but I think, you know, in the old days, people talked about patient to public involvement. Now we talk about co-production. Um, there's been a, um, an increased profile for things like citizens' juries, not only in relation to health, but in, in relation to political matters. Um, the, the rising interest in citizen science um, the notion that patients aren't necessarily just there to be involved, maybe partners, maybe more than partners, maybe actually initiating research. So the notion of patient-led research and that the, the associated notions of patient leadership and patient entrepreneurship, I think are changing the way we think about the, the traditional framing for this was there is a research business that professionals carry on and then they invite members of the public to come in and take part on their terms. And I think increasingly that feels um, unsatisfactory uh, and not sufficiently democratic. There are some very important cross-cutting themes that NHR as a, as a corporate body is working on, which are very strongly related to the particular focus on public involvement, but go wider. Um, so the whole of NHR is energised by the possibility of getting the public more interested in and involved in and participating in research because of the resurgent interest around COVID-19, which for all the bad things it's done, has created a greater awareness about um, uh, research amongst the public. And I think there's a there's a big question within NIH about how, how can the research system capitalise on that renewed interest. Um, there's cross-cutting work on equality, diversity and inclusion, um, uh, as in many organisations and funders and research right now, and a related interest in how can you bring research to those areas of the country and those communities who have not been sufficiently touched by research, either in terms of their direct engagement with it or in terms of whether that research is addressing their needs and has an impact that is meeting their needs. Uh, a lot of work going on in uh, trying to create a more digitally enabled research uh, um, ecosystem and, and the, that has huge consequences for how the public and patients can relate uh, to research. And a big piece of work on value and impact. How do we know what impact we're having and how can you assess that? Um, it's a big tricky one for a large research funder. Um, um, and as part of that, there are some really interesting questions about how do we capture and assess and understand the value and impact of public involvement. So those are some of the cross-cutting themes that our centre is, is very closely um, tapped into. Uh, do patients and public have a say? Uh, that was uh, one of the questions for this conference. Um, yes. Um, some people have more of a say than others, and there's a lot of unfairness in that. Um, most of it not deliberate, but kind of structural. Um, people might have a say, but not in the things they really want to have a say in, or not a say at the most important parts of the research journey. So there's some really interesting questions about how you ensure that the processes and the incentives um, actually encourage um, involvement at the points where it can be most influential. Um, I think it does often come too late to influence those really important decisions. Um, I don't think it always makes a difference. Uh, I think there's a lot of public involvement activity, um, but we can't be sure that all that activity is providing value and impact as felt and experienced by those who are involved in it from their different perspectives. And even if, if, even if it is making a difference, how do we know and how can we learn from that to do better? How can we learn from our successes and how can we learn 
from our failures, which I think are equally important and valuable. Um, fact is, I don't think we have a strong enough ecosystem of learning um, and capturing of evidence that, that allows us to create a kind of virtuous cycle of learning. So I think there are some really important issues there that, 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 that it's incumbent upon all of us to, to worry about and, and, and to some extent provide an agenda for the Centre for Engagement and uh, Dissemination. So as a consequence, the, the work that we're doing is focusing on a number of key themes, one of which is inclusion and diversity and equality um, in, in a number of different dimensions. Um, one of which is how, how can we use the power of digital to enable people to be more included and more involved? Um, and uh, I think we've all been on a learning journey to discover how much more it's possible to engage remotely than we thought was possible before COVID. But at the same time, being acutely aware that lots of people are necessarily left out uh, as a consequence of doing things online. We are doing some work to try and get better at capturing the knowledge about what works and doesn't work um, so that we can be on a learning journey, a continuous learning journey to, to make involvement better. Um, part of that is looking at incentives and processes. NIHR is a complicated ecosystem. I must stop using that word, by the way, because it's become overused uh, by me in particular, uh, but it's not really a single organisation. It's a, it's, a, it's a large system with lots of different activities and processes um, and incentives, carrots and sticks that um, um, that either promote public involvement or, or to some extent uh, possibly uh, inadvertently get in the way of it. So we need to have a better understanding about how those carrots and sticks and processes are working and whether they can be tweaked. Um, I think uh, doing public involvement well is not straightforward. Um, it requires um, knowledge, skills, confidence, uh, capacity, um, a particular mindset, um, and um, it needs help and support to people who get involved, patients and the public, um, and to researchers, and to those people whose job is to promote involvement and engagement. Um, how do we have the right training and development and resources and support in place? It feels quite patchy and fragmented, um, and I, I feel we can do better. And so that's another area where we're going to be looking to see if we can create something more consistent and coherent. Um, that's me. That's our improvement agenda in a nutshell um, for public involvement. Um, but critically, you need to hear from Tina now, who may give you a different perspective than all this, um, which I very much welcome. So thank you very much for listening. Jeremy, thank you very much. Um, and Tina, a very warm welcome to you. Uh, so I will just say a few words about you, if I may, because I think it's important that people know a little bit about you. Um, so T Tina has um, described herself as a mental health service user for 17 years. And um, uh, I think the phrase you used, Tina, is a practicing depressive. Um, yeah. It's important. <laughs> It's important that we know that uh, you recently were chair of the National Survivor User Network, um, so you've been involved um, in, in, with, with service users nationally, um, and you're on the board of the Social Care Institute for Excellence and um, are chairing their co-production network. So that will clearly give you some very um, uh, fascinating insights into the national picture and um, developments in co-production um, and um, clearly you're going to talk from authority from all of those perspectives so a very warm welcome to you and thank you so much for joining Jeremy in your joint presentation. Uh, yeah so the first slide then is uh, as the power to the people and I was thinking you know you were talking about that that TV show of that time uh, and I was thinking about uh, the song power to the people power to the people right on um, absolutely. Um, uh, that sort of stuff en en energises me. Uh, as I said, I've, yeah, I've, I've been working as a mental health service user consultant for, for many years uh, and uh, involved in involved for uh, quite a long time and, and uh, as was on their advisory group committee So and, and, and was lucky enough to chair it uh, for the last sort of two and a half years. Um, uh, until uh, we've gone into the new structure. So um, uh, Jeremy's welcoming me in, in terms of helping set up uh, to bring some continuity and a little bit of organisational memory. Um, but I am indeed also, when I'm not uh, fiddling about and cajoling Jeremy, is 
uh, uh, conducting research as a survivor researcher in, in mental health. We, we call ourselves survivor researchers. I won't go into the politics of that now, uh, but I, I, at the present, uh, NIH are funded uh, research. I'm working with two other survivor researchers who are academics. I bring the brawn um, and uh, we're in the middle uh, of, of doing some research at the moment. So it does happen. Uh, it needs to happen more. Uh, if anybody's interested, they can talk to me about it. OK, so do people have a say? Services? Yes-ish. Um, as Jeremy said, it's, uh, yeah, um, yeah, well, they're sort of-ish. I mean, that's how I, you know, got into this game, if you like. Uh, working locally uh, as an activist, uh, running self-help peer support groups, uh, running a, a user group where we try to influence and, and have a say in local services um, many years ago now. But, uh, you know, it's uh, <laughs> um, it's very sporadic and, 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 and power is, you know, comes and goes as it, as it is not shared or is relinquished from you. So, and in terms of research, well, yes, do we have a say? Well, sort of, you know, uh, again, you know, uh, I've just said I, I am conducting some research which we initiated. Um, it's just the three of us who are survivor researchers and we're bringing in other perspectives from other uh, uh, people with mental health problems, but also, uh, you know, professionals as well. But we're we're leading the way with that. So, um, it, you know, but there is lots of other opportunities to get involved in research um, and some of it happens really well and some of it doesn't happen at all. Um, and the sign there says danger keep out. That is a picture of my career at NIHR um, rapidly uh, disappearing now. Um, I mean, I just want to reflect on the, the mission, one of the mission statements or the, 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 the uh, objectives that uh, we have or strategic aims that, that the NIHR has, that NIHR engages and involves patients, carers and the public in the processes by which researchers identified prioritised, designed, conducted, evaluated and disseminated. Uh, and we do this in order to improve research quality impact of our research. So it's very much in the, the present tense uh, that we are doing it, not we aspire to or we hope to or we strive to. We are doing it. Well, as I said before, sort of. Um, so, you know, I think uh, the intention is good. The delivery is is, is somewhat patchy. Uh, but th but there we are. I mean, you know, we, we're, we're on a journey and I'm very happy to be on that, that journey uh, with you. But do listen, <laughs> do listen to us on that. Um, so where do we go next in NIHR? I mean, Jeremy has, has, has said we've got the new centre. There's a new focus building on, uh, a, you know, a legacy of enormously valuable works, which we don't want to lose uh, and we want to uh, appreciate uh, and and uh make sure is still there for 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 people um and you know involved when we did the review going the extra mile um uh, we talked to people all over the world i mean that was the most amazing thing we garnered views from you know people you know uh in the uk but other people abroad and organizations say wow you had a really great outfit there uh yes we did uh and they've modeled their own systems upon it so um it, you know, we need somebody to uh, be helping with this stuff. As Jeremy said, uh, you need some input of some kind, people who know what they're doing to help other people who don't. Uh, so, you know, it is a, it, you know, uh, it's not just a, a linear process. There's a lot to, to learn and know about involvement and we're all learning as we all go along. Uh, so, you know, um, and the new centre, you know, uh, 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 we were trying to think really, because the emphasis was always on just involvement, which is not just. Uh, but when we're now looking at the whole uh, range in terms of uh, uh, considering participation in, in trials and also engagement, that wider connecting with more people, which we do need to do. Um, uh, and we always knew that. So, um, so hopefully we can have a pie and eat it. And it's not just in the new centre, it's about us working closely you know with the rest of the uh, research research infrastructure uh, around that and and helping helping them uh, engage in this debate and understand and also celebrate what they do because there's some great stuff going on out there we don't involve never claimed or said that would never claim i don't think 
say we know it all. Absolutely not. I think it's about celebrating, you know, other people's achievements as well. What does that mean? Uh, it means uh, more user-led research. I would say that, wouldn't I? Um, because I'm, <laughs> I come from that perspective. Um, I think, you know, COVID has made it very, uh, well, I mean, the irony is COVID has, has made research prominent in most people's minds uh, now where it never was. We, this is the time to capitalise upon that. But also realising, you know, people are saying to me, oh, when's, when's the vaccine, uh, you know, coming out? And I, I, I probably won't venture out of the house or do much until the vaccine comes. And I'm saying, well, it might be a little while yet. Um, although we're fast tracking it and, you know, uh, there's some amazing efforts going on. Um, but I mean, I think that the, the, the thing is, it's, it's uh, people have to appreciate how, how much time it takes to really understand and research and appreciate uh, what we have to learn. But also the, 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 you know, what the issues are from a user, uh, you know, perspective. We're learning with COVID as we go along what the issues are. Um, and it, one of the reasons I got into, into research was I didn't feel mental health services really understood what mattered to me uh, and what would help me. So, you know, that was a, a main driver for me to do this, uh, you know, work, uh, but to get involved in research. So, I, you know, one a big priority for me is, is how we uh, as, as uh, a research industry, as, as NIHR, as academia, uh, can focus more on what users more local communities uh, have in terms of their their issues and what we can do about that in terms of research. Um, obviously more co-production as Jeremy said this was uh, again I've been involved in co-production uh, work where you're working equally alongside other people so not not completely the revolution of the power to the people but it's just taking some of that power uh, and uh, um, it, it, it is very satisfying, I have to say, uh, with the stuff I did at Sky, which wasn't research, but it was about enabling uh, social care uh, knowledge products uh, uh, to be user and, and carer services and carer uh, person centred in the products that went out to the social care sort of uh, practitioners. Um, so, you know, that we did uh, some really, you know, and I, I got to work with people from all over across the disability spectrum, people from with different uh, different uh, needs and issues. And you learn a lot and it's very humbling and it's very gratifying as well. Um, who, who is out there and what you can learn from, from one another. And I'm talking about ordinary folk, not just professionals. Ordinary folk have enormous insights into their issues uh, and, and uh, if we help them along the way, we can find what the, what the uh, answers are. So definitely more user-led research, definitely more co-production. Um, we need to identify those needs. I don't think we systemically do that enough on the ground. Um, um, but also, you know, in terms of research, uh, you know, how, how we really look locally and work out what, what is needed and how we can reach out. We can improve very much on that. And therefore be open to more innovative solutions. Um, and I'm not talking about apps uh, that the Secretary of State seems to favour uh, and fail to deliver. Oh, there goes my career. Um, I'm talking about things that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm minded of the, the, the disability movement of the, eight, the 80s. People who uh, were stuck in care homes didn't want to be there. They said, why do you give the care homes the money? We hate it here. We'd rather be dead. Give us the money. And therefore, the uh, concept of direct payments was born. Um, and, you know, uh, I know some of those pioneering people, sadly, some of them have passed away, but they've had a better life than they would have had. And I'm not dissing care homes because some of them are amazing, lovely places, but it's about choice and control, which is the, the what words of the, the, uh, the independent living movement. And, you know, they came up with this, you know, radical but basic idea. And it is and isn't sort of implemented into, uh, in, into our everyday uh, service provision, personalization, um, you know, how people get the money, how they can keep the money, what they can spend it on. There's a lot of arguments about it, and I've been involved with research around that. Um, but the point is that was something ordinary folk came up with, and it works for them. 
if we trust them to do that. And I think we need to in, we need to let go a little bit more uh, around some of these things. So it is working in more inclusive ways, as Jeremy said. Um, the uh, you know the Black Lives Matter. Uh, we have austerity uh, problems. There are lots of other inequality issues uh, out there. So we we need to be live to that and. Uh, and also from people, you know, like myself, this sort of white average, you know, middle aged woman, there's too many of us in, in lurking about doing this. We we're very conscious. We want to bring some new blood in other people, other voices, other issues. I think it's uh, it's it's very important. Um, I just refer back to what Jeremy said about, uh, you know, uh, do people have a say in research? You know, I said sort of, and he said, well, uh, there was, a, you know, there are structural issues. Um, it's not malicious or, or you know, in, intent, but actually we can do a lot to, 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 to pull down those structural issues and, and really think about how we work with people uh, in new and, uh, you know, and, and much more simple and friendlier ways. And what the centre can do? Well, as you can say, we obviously we should be Modeling good practice always involved, always did, in, said, intends to. Uh, and I think we should lead the way as we always have done. And I, I'm really excited to, to think that we can we can do that. Um, um, I think, you know, if we can do that, when we can become infectious, uh, it's a bit like COVID, but in a good way. Um, <laughs> you know, if we can do it, you, you encourage other people to do it and, and, and do some uh, some new ways of, of, of working. We've got a new interim advisory group, which is made up of mostly people from uh, from uh, different backgrounds to my, myself. A lot of it focused on people from the BAME communities or different people from those different perspectives. We're only just met once, it's early days, but already I think in, you know, the, the possibilities about how we can ask uh, different people that you know live here and contribute here uh, about what matters to them and what we should be researching. So it's important that we do that, and it's important that we work in partnership with uh, with NIHR and others, academia, and also the charity sector, which I you know I spent a lot of time uh, coming from and working uh, with uh, over the years. Um, a lot of those guys are a little bit more free up. No money, but a little bit freer to be able to uh, to 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 work, uh, you know, more consistently with with people on on the ground. So it's important, I think, especially as money is tight, uh, that we offer what we can and work together and find solutions together. Yes. So power to the people. Power to the people. Right on was obviously uh, John Lennon. Uh, for those of us of a certain age, uh, who was obviously eight, he would have been eighty last week. God bless him. Uh, and that was when he left the, the Beatles and, and formed uh, the classic Ono band. Uh, and the words of his song, here we are, say we want a revolution, we better get on your right, you better get on your right away. Uh, we better then get on your feet and enter the street. So, I mean, what he's saying is, you know, get up, get do it, get out there um, and also sing power to the people. Um, so I, I won't sing that for you today, so you'll be mildly uh, 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 relieved to know. But um, uh, I, I think absolutely power to the, uh, the people right on. Um, and, you know, we, we well, I'll leave it there. Power to the people right on. Jeremy, Tina, thank you very, very much indeed. Um, uh, there was power for um, uh, topic and some food for thought in both of your presentations. Um, and um, you've touched on inclusion, which is um, something we might explore uh, in today's conference. And also, um, I think in the, in the chat, and I think Jeremy, so you're asking yourself a question there, but uh, about incense, incentives and how do we involve people? Um, you've given us the courtesy of some time for questions. We have got some time for, for kind of um, panel questions, but I'm quite keen um, as we have the two of you here and that our thoughts are fresh that we, yep. we give an opportunity people ask questions now if you're happy with that and um, I have one um two two people have put questions in in the chat so Julian and Elizabeth um I don't know if you want me to read your questions out but they're so important it might be better for you to um ask them Ju Julian Hollingworth first are you happy to ask your question or do you want me to to read it out 
Uh, yes, I, I, I can ask. I'm just finding the question. Um, yes, yeah, so what I was asking is, uh, are there ways of NIHR, NIHR uh, supporting or guiding or funding microservice user-led research, such as in a small mental health project where I work, um, service users identifying the issues, perhaps through our service user council. This could be a way to engage people that might not take part in larger research projects. You, shall I go first, uh, Tina? Yeah. Um, the, uh, this is partly a question about how the current funding system actually works, and I have to confess that I've still, I'm still learning about how it works. Um, but broadly speaking, I suspect this is probably possible if we choose to do it. Yeah. Um, uh, and it, it, it would, it would probably fit within the ambit of a number of existing programs like Research for Patient Benefit. Um, but. Um, uh, I think it's a really interesting question I mean, that, that I asked a question of myself, as it were, um, which is a similar one about which was sparked by Tina's comments about direct payments. If you can have direct payments for services, could you have the equivalent in research, which would be fairly small amounts of money to allow people to go off and do their own research? Um, I, I, I think it, it's a really interesting idea. I can't. I mean, I just need to take that away and think about it because I think it, it would be a really good thing for NIHR to do potentially. And it probably wouldn't be very expensive, but it could be quite, um, could potentially be quite uh, uh, um, impactful. So th th thank you for raising that. I think it, I think it's a good point. I think it's a good question challenge. Tina, did you want to come back or are you happy for me to go to the next question? Uh, no, I, I, I very much uh, uh, agree with the, the question. Absolutely. I think the... the um, I think there are problems. I mean, the research I'm doing is because I uh, am linked with two people who are survivor researchers, but they are in academia. They're brave enough and resilient enough to work for universities, um, and uh, so they have a have a they have a certain amount of power there as uh, given to them as as employees of a university uh, and. Uh, uh, um, can you know apply officially apply for the money and uh, hold hold the money? So uh, you know that's that's you know that's the way it happens at the moment. But I think we should you know <laughs> um, they're, and they're not they're not advocating that for that at all e e either. It's just one way, and I think it's absolutely right that we should you know uh, be able to say here is some money for you chaps. Who do you want to help you on your way with with research? And there is there are lots of uh, you know examples of where that has happened. Although the university has perhaps held the money, they've had an academic who's gone out on the ground and worked with local communities and helped them understand, you know, uh, uh, you know about research and the technicalities and but 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 involve them uh, and help them on the way to to be articulating what it is that they think would help them. So. We know it does go on. It doesn't go on enough. So um, absolutely, you know, I think that would be that would be part of the revolution. I'd love to see where you know, and we can get some quick wins uh, and really, you know, really change things on the ground. That would be super. Thank you very much, uh, Tamar. I will come to you because um, you've um, asked to, to ask a question, but I'll read out Elizabeth's question first because her microphone isn't attached. So Elizabeth Morrow asked to the two of you, a key issue for me as a public representative at NIHR is how do we extend methods of engagement to be more inclusive whilst not losing the expertise of the people who've developed expertise and contributed the evidence base for public engagement? Can we develop more two tier and multifaceted approaches to involvement? Whichever you, Tina, do you want to go first? Um, I don't even think it's two tier. I mean, I think there are there are multifaceted, uh, multifaceted, uh, uh, you know, approaches to to involvement. I think it, it it takes people who know about involvement to make to make that happen, uh, and a bit of imagination and learning from it from each other. So, as I say, you know, I, I you know, I. I <laughs> I've been doing research, but I can remember years ago as part of a, a research team of users where uh, we were employed by an organisation. But the boss said, well, you know, how much of this stuff do you want to do, guys? Um, you know, so it was like she handed over the power and responsibility and here's the money to go with it. We're going to pay you, of course, uh, which was very nice. Uh, but it was in a helpful and constructive uh, way. And 
you know, and then you take baby steps and then you realise that, uh, you know, the possibilities that you can do this stuff. It's not a strange, you know, different world that, uh, you know, belongs to other people. So um, absolutely, I, you know, I, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, it, it can happen. It does happen. It needs to happen more. But we do have to look at those structural issues uh, around it and work with people who have that job title as PPI lead or coordinator uh, to to see what the issues are and help break down some of those barriers. Thank you, Tina. Jeremy, did you want to add anything? I, yeah, I mean, I think it's not a binary thing. It's an and-and thing, isn't it? That you want the people who are experienced and have, have, have provided a huge contribution over a number of years, like Tina. And you also want other people who have, have come with different backgrounds and experiences. Um, and I think we, so, you know, I think we need to be creative um, um, and, and avoid binary thinking. Some of the debate about inclusion contains unintended, but I think implicit criticisms of people who are sometimes called the usual suspects, um, which I think is deeply unfair. <laughs> um, I think uh, you want, you want we should celebrate our usual suspects and also look for some other usual suspects and, and some unusual suspects and just get a whole, you know, a whole bunch of people. I yeah. also think a lot of this is about creating uh, what I would call a kind of culture of engagement around particular research institutions uh, and organisations. That the, the idea that there, if you are doing research, you should also have a relationship with the communities that you are part of, and build up those communities over time, um, and, and ensure that you're getting a diversity of, of uh, people and views and backgrounds involved. Um, and I think there are some places that are, that are doing that quite well. Um, it takes effort and skill and persistence and funding to do that. Um, but, but I think it, it then provides a very good platform for lots, lots of different things going on within a particular place or setting. Thank you. Well, um, uh, Ellen has flashed up a question about that, said, who, who are the usual suspects, though? I don't know whether that's something uh, either of you want to respond to before I come to Tamar, who's, who's been patiently waiting. Oh, I, I see too much of me at the moment. So, yeah, I, I, I am one of them. But, you know, sometimes it is about being there and, and saying this stuff. But it's also about saying, come on, let's bring other people in. So advocating for that and hopefully helping other, other people. Uh, uh, as well, because I don't want to be looking at my face in this 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 Zoom or whatever we are in the next ten leading years. But you know, I, 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 you know, I want to be seeing other people and and other things, new 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 things. You know, the, the issues don't lie. With but Tamar, did you want to ask your question? Um, I was thinking that the uh, um, um, the conversation around um, sort of involvement and participation is actually very backwards um, because. The way that we're, um, or the way that the conversation is kind of looking at it is um, actually how do we involve people? What do we do? And it's kind of like it's asking all these questions. Whereas actually, um, when you look at the whole survivor movement, the survivor movement came first and said, actually, we insist on being um, part of these decisions. And it, it was only once that pressure was there that, um, um, that, we have the invention of public and patient involvement. So, um, what I was um, what I was going to say was really the answers are out there. It's not about you saying how how do we do this. It's about listening to what's out there already. And um, I, I was thinking of um, the work that's been done by Diana Rose, Peter Beresford, um, and um, oh, Sarah, Sarah Cars. They've done they've done a few papers recently where they've said. Actually, we're, we're kind of um, professors and doctors working in this area, but you know what? We never get funding. We don't get um, to work with clinical investigators. What we've got instead at the moment are, um, it, you know, you've got an HR, and I'm um, someone who works kind of um, in some of these participatory groups. Well, you know, I'm a, I'm a researcher, <laughs> so I'm a lived experience researcher. It's um, a discipline within itself. Um, yeah. But, but, you know why um when i'm working on these teams why are we not employed within the team as lived experience researchers why are all these um when when funding gets allocated why is it not going to our lived experience researchers who are um 
And if, if it does go to public and patient involvement, we should be on there. You know, post-production is about sharing power. It's about we should be making the decisions about the money, not kind of people saying, oh, here's a little bit of money for you to go off and do a little bit of tin pot research. Well, you know, <laughs> and what, why are there only a handful of us? Millions and millions of pounds go into, um, you know, public and patient involvement. So you're making a lot of money off us, but not employing us. And yeah. there's a lot of people with, with quite, I've worked in research since I'm 19. I'm like 43 now. Do you know what I mean? I shouldn't be on some, in, in, you know, some flipping participatory boot. I should be there employed within a team. Yeah. And same for a lot of other people, you know, I work with people with PhDs. So the, the question is, when are you going to stop saying, how do we involve you? And actually say, actually, guys, you're equal. We're going to employ you within our teams as as equals and also recognize the difference between um between co-production and between participation so there's there's roles for us working and there's sharing this power and doing that on an employed basis the bit where you're um kind of like conducting the research and asking people's opinions that's that's kind of a different part and you need both so my challenge to you is when are you going to give us equality and have us there on the teams and making decisions and sharing the power. Because yeah. doing it this way, how are we going to involve you? That ain't going to work. Okay, Tamar, I'm going to I'm just interrupt you in view of time now, obviously. So this, that's, quite a big, that's quite a big question and clearly um, comes from a, a platform of experience. I don't know whether you want to answer it now or we leave that hanging because we've got a question and answer session later where we can return to it because it clearly is an important question. Um, do we do that? Leave it so that we can hear the next two speakers and then return to it. So, so it, it is. It is about power. It's about finance. It's about, and I think it's quite complex. But um, now, would you? Should we? Should we come back at eleven? Uh, no. I, I, I... Okay. Okay. So in view of the time, I'm going to move on. I just want to um, um, ask you all to just thank our two uh, speakers very much. Um, uh, I, I had a question which I'm not going to get to ask now, but, but, I, but I will, <laughs> which was just a point about um, um, as, as a retired doctor, I remember when I had my first serious health problem, I suddenly became an expert by experience. And you kind of, you, that you, you appropriate, you're in danger of appropriating that eating that territory. Um, I'm quite fascinated by the fact that two of our world leaders, or well, more of our world leaders, of course, have now had COVID. One of them, our Prime Minister, seemingly quite um, a nasty um, experience of COVID. And um, I'll leave this question hanging, but I wonder how much um, political leaders' experience influences their judgment in being able to listen to other um, experts by experience. And my concern here is about the mental health um, lived experience in relation to COVID and in general, because that's being weighed in the balance now, isn't it? With other contingencies like the economy and like lockdown. Um, I'm not expecting an answer for that, but um, it, maybe it's something to ponder that actually those of us that do have something go wrong can appropriate or misappropriate this territory. And I think Tamar's point is a very, very important one that we shall return to. So um, thank you both, Jeremy and Tina. Um, you're both national influencers, so it's a great privilege for us to have your ear and have you here. So thank you both very much. I'm going to now introduce um, Gary Hickey, who I know of old, who is um, a consultant, trainer and project and research manager. So we're now hearing from the kind of researcher researcher perspective um, and, and Gary's uh, interest is in ensuring that research translates into policy and action and he was actually very much involved in setting up the Centre for Public Engagement so um, he's an old friend as, uh, 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 as well. He's chair of his local health watch, um, he has a first degree in public administration and a PhD in health studies. So Gary welcome back, um, it's great to see you here, um, over to you sir. Lovely. Thank you very much for the introduction, uh, uh, Mandy. And unlike Tina, I'm going to have to update my uh, biography, uh, um, I, I think. Uh, and also thanks to uh, Mary Chambers uh, and Duncan Barron for inviting me today. Basically, working co-productively, a living experiment. So uh, I currently have two roles at the Research Design Service Southeast, uh, which I'll come on to uh, um, in a moment, and the Western Institute University of Southampton. And I'm going to share with you today what we're doing uh, as part of the patient and public involvement team at the Research Design Service Southeast to kind of push this idea of power to the people. 
And what we're trying to do is to, to use the or follow, if you like, the co-production principles to guide how we work um, as a team, including their public members. Now, it, it's very, very, very early days in our experiment, and it is an experiment. Uh, and I'm going to share with you today some of the things that we're doing and we plan to do. Now, whether or not, in reality, and, and I'm thinking of the things Tamara said, whether or not what we're doing is really just perhaps improve patient and public invol involvement or is co-production. I guess it's for other people to kind of decide, but all I can do is share with you our aspirations uh, and what we're trying to do and how we're trying to capture our journey to help us improve. So I'm going to give you a little bit of context about the research design service uh, in the South East, the uh, principles of co-production. I'll just quickly go through those and then how we're trying to put those principles into practice. So the research design service, what do we do? Well, broadly, the Research Design Service, we are part of the National Institute for Health Research, uh, as Jeremy said, part of that big ecosystem. Uh, and what we do broadly is provide advice and guidance on research proposals. And of course, as part of the patient and public involvement team, we provide advice and guidance clearly on patient and public involvement. But we also do um, a range of other things. We have a, a public involvement fund, which is to enable researchers to involve patients um, public and uh, developing their proposals. We have a co-production podcast, that co-production podcast, uh, which Jeremy was uh, our very first guest on there. We were very honoured. Uh, we have a regional forum where we're seeking to link up with other organisations in the area uh, um, to, to make sure that our activities around patient public involvement and co-production are joined up. We have a Black, Asian and ethnic minority group because obviously we recognise the, uh, people from those communities are often underrepresented uh, in research, both in terms of participating and involvement. Uh, and we have a young person advisory group. And of course, we do a range of uh, regional events. So that's broadly what we do at the South East. And, and, and I, I lead a, a patient and public involvement team, a small team. So what is co-production? Well, basically, uh, um, it's an approach uh, in which researchers, practitioners, public members uh, work together, sharing power and responsibility. Uh, and including in the generation of knowledge. And we often talk about it, the, the uh, guidance that was developed, and, and Tina was uh, um, involved with me uh, in developing this guidance. We co-produced the guidance, I should say. Uh, we identify um, five principles, and I'll just quickly whip through these, just so we're all on the same page. The first principle is sharing of power, and this is the, the key one. So it's the idea that the project or whatever it is you're doing is jointly owned, uh, uh, by people, when people work together to achieve a joint understanding. So it's about sharing responsibility, uh, and it's also about identifying and seeking to address power differentials uh, in, the, in the enterprise, in the room. And clearly there are power differentials, and that's already been alluded to. Uh, including all perspective and skills, it's making sure that the team includes all those who can make a contribution. So it's the idea of embracing diversity and inclusivity and making sure that you've got the necessary view, skill, experience and knowledge uh, around that table. Uh, respecting and valuing the knowledge of all those working together on a project. So it's the idea that everybody, and Tamara touched on this, everybody's of equal importance. And it's about respecting that people bring different knowledge bases to the table. And that might be lived experience, it might be research experience, but they're different but equal. Reciprocity, the idea everybody benefits from working together, that we all get something uh, from being involved in this enterprise. Uh, and finally, building and maintaining relationships. And, and I can't stress the importance of this one enough. Uh, and I think an emphasis on relationships is key to sharing power. And I think there needs to be a joint understanding, consensus and clarity about roles, responsibilities, and we need to value people and, and unlock our sort of collective potential. We need to build trust in relationships. So that's what we're trying to aspire to at the Research Design Service South East. Uh, um, so now what I'm going to do, I'm going to sort of take you through those different principles and just touch on in, in the few minutes that I've got some of the things that we're trying to do. So sharing power, now, as I say, this is the key principle and it's a theme that cuts across all of the other principles. And let's accept that power differentials do exist. And it's often rooted in sort of wider societal and economic differences. And we have to acknowledge these power differentials, I think, and constantly seek to address them. Now, so what are we doing with our PPI team? Now, I'm, I'm going to focus on what we're doing at meetings. And I know that in the overall scheme of things, that meetings are a very small thing. But hopefully, 
when I come on to the other differences, you'll also see how we're trying to address the power differentials as well, because it is something that cuts right across. So what have we done? Well, we've appointed, um, we're changing the way how we do meetings. So basically we've appointed uh, um, public members to be part of our team uh, at the Research Design Service. Uh, um, and we've got a few members on there at the moment. Of course, there's the idea there's power and safety uh, in numbers. And the idea is we're appointed people for a period of time. So that enables us to develop relationships with people and about how we work, how they work, and we'll come to some kind of consensus. We decided to have a, a rotating chair, uh, you know, this idea of taking it uh, in terms of chair. And I, th I think it's not only symbolic, but it does give that feeling, in my view, that it's no longer like my meeting or someone else meeting, but it's our meeting. I think if you're chairing, it's our meeting. We've developed a set of uh, ways uh, um, of working, uh, um, ground rules, if you like, and we, we developed and agreed these collectively. Uh, and that sort of helped sort of set a tone of collaboration and a sense that one group's norms uh, weren't, if you like, being imposed upon uh, another group. Um, and voting, of course, and we now introduce sort of voting into our meetings on, on, on some issues and everyone's vote uh, carries equals weight. Uh, we think this can be a good way of sharing of power. Uh, um, so, for example, uh, I proposed, I think, that lay members would be on the team um, for two years because we want to encourage inclusivity and diversity and then you know, we'd switch people around. Uh, um, but we put this to, uh, to a vote because uh, one of the public members argued it should be a shorter of time, period of time. Uh, and I lost that vote, so perhaps it wasn't such a good idea um, um, after all. But, you know, but that's the way it goes in a vote. Uh, and this is just, I won't get, go through all of these, but this is uh, um, the ways of working that we developed uh, as a group. Uh, um, you know, someone um, took it away and developed a set of rules. Um, some of the, the public members didn't like the idea of rules because they felt this was actually about more than rules. This is about culture as well. So we've changed this uh, um, to ways of working. Um, I'll just go back to that. And, and there is um, something ab about this, I, I think, that was doing it as an exercise helps us, say, set that tone for collaboration. I think that does help to create a kind of a, a nice team environment. Uh, and I think that's what we are trying to work towards, to be in a team, not them and us, a team working together. And I think all of that is good. But as one as the, I think public members have made to me that the point of sharing power is it's about more than creating a nice team environment where people are treated well. It's about giving people roles with meaningful responsibilities and ownership. I think it's also worth mentioning here that sharing power doesn't mean that everybody is equally involved in every decision. Uh, you know, we don't do everything by committee because you're still need, going to need people to lead on particular things. But I think to give people roles and responsibilities, I think we do need to move away from the idea that opera vows that, that there are hierarchies of knowledge with researcher or professional knowledge at the top. And I think we've got to move towards valuing different knowledge and skills that people bring and how they can contribute. And we need sometimes to help people contribute. So we need to respect and value the knowledge of all those making a contribution. And that's our next principle. And my personal view and experience is that this issue of meaningful, respons meaningful responsibility really does change things uh, um, for public members and indeed professionals too, who haven't worked on a co-produced project before. And I'll exaggerate slightly, and so please people don't take offence, but I think it means that the public role is no longer about critique, just, just critiquing, commenting and identifying flaws, valuable and important though they are, but it really is about working together, it's about negotiating, it's about compromising, and it's about collectively, I think, generating solutions and knowledge uh, um, on which we feel like we can all agree to enable us to move forward. So I think there really is a fundamental difference about how we're trying to work. And one of the things we started to do, if you like, is to start asking some questions. So we start a conversation, if you will, with our public members and indeed our whole team. And based broadly, I would say, around these questions, you know, what skills or transferable skills knowledge do people have at the moment? How do people want to develop? So we start touching on reciprocity here and what support do people need to enable them to contribute? You know, so, for example, some people want to do presentations. Fantastic. 
some people want to develop their skills in print presentations great and usually we'd have two people doing it and i do apologize um but we couldn't get anyone for this particular presentation uh, um we have a podcast series do you know and again we discussed this and who wanted to be involved uh, um doing the interviews on the podcast and um, thinking about what questions we're going to do and it enables people to sort of develop their, their skills in ways uh, um, that are important to them i think that's really really important but I'm just going to pause there and make one of my, my many points. And this is something I think that Jeremy touched on. Again, these things are good, but I am very aware, I'm not kidding myself, there's still a sense here of staff divesting themselves of power, of handing over power. You know, that sense, if you like, of well-intentioned paternalism. Uh, and there's still a sense of the engagement discussions taking place on professional researcher terms. You know, the, the idea of formal meetings with an agenda, et cetera. And we know, don't we, this isn't always how people interact or want to interact. Uh, um, but of course, this may be an alien environment to some people who want to express themselves in different ways. So can we do more to allow people to express themselves in different ways, uh, to address those power imbalances in a way that suits them rather than the research professionals? And if we can do that, then I think it does really help to address their power differentials. And again, I'm just going to touch on some of the things of those things when I talk about the next principle, building and maintaining relationships. As I say, this for me is really important, it's absolutely crucial. We want to build trust and relationships. And I think this is really the key to sharing power. And one of the ways we can do that is to step outside of our roles, our professional roles particularly. Uh, as one of our public members said to me, it's about developing relationships on a human level. And if we can do that, everybody feels a bit more comfortable in the room. So this is some of the things that we started doing. Well, the, the two uh, um, examples in blue there. So one is this idea of dropping titles. Now, last year we did a co-production conference with the Centre for Public Engagement uh, and indeed others. And we made a decision there to drop titles. There's something about that, you know, if you say, oh, this is Dr Hickey speaking or whatever, people come with certain assumptions. It's not a very informal way of going about things, is it? So let's drop the titles. It's a very small thing, but I think if you can talk to someone without their titles, it just helps remove that little barrier. Building in time for social chat. Of course, that's a little bit more difficult, maybe, when we're doing everything at the moment online. But one of the things we've started doing at team meetings, we're having maybe a little 10 minutes uh, uh, break at the beginning where it's like a checking in thing. How are people? What are they doing, etc.? What's going on in their lives? Probably not much at the moment with COVID, to be fair, but you know, still the effort is there. Uh, and there's other things that we could do. Icebreakers we could introduce. We could maybe celebrate events. It might be, you know, personal events for people, uh, uh, um, but I think that can help create a more informal atmosphere. We could have meetings at neutral venues. At the moment, I guess you could argue they are neutral because people are doing it from their own home. Uh, something I would like to explore in the future is, is borrowing from the world of arts and design. Uh, and I think some really great examples there of uh, uh, working co-productively and the whole process there helps to sort of create uh, uh, um, or address those power differentials. And I think that that's really, really, really important. But I'm now going to move on to the next two principles, reciprocity and valuing impacts that emerge from the research process. And, and, I, and I'll address these together and it'll become clear why. So reciprocity, this is about everybody getting something from working uh, in, in this way, in this co-production way on this enterprise. And I'm going to touch on two things here. One is about relationships. It's about moving away from the transactional to the relational. And the second one is this issue of value and impacts that emerge from the research process. So by transactional, what I mean is we often as researchers, we have a very functional relationship with people we involve in our work. And I think we tend to engage with people. We involve them for specific purpose. We, we pay them if they're lucky. We say thank you if they're lucky. Uh, uh, we use them for a specific purpose. And then we move on to the next thing. So it tends to be very short term relationships uh, um, and only for as long usually as the project lasts. I think co-production uh, requires a, a kind of a different relationship, something more relational, something longer term, 
um, something that involves the development of trust. Uh, and I've got a quote here from one of our public members, and I, and I would say I, I hesitate before putting this up because anyone can get a quote, I think, from a public member and saying, oh, oh, aren't we just say how great we are, etc. But I kind of thought this was the best example, I think, that came through it, and, and I really like this. Uh, um, so she said, as a lay member of the RDS Southeast, I felt appreciated, respected and heard, which for someone with enduring health issues is very valuable indeed. It's felt like a very reciprocal process. My background, experience and skills bring something worthwhile to the table and I get to learn about all sorts of fascinating research ideas in return. So a bit of reciprocity there. My role has also given me opportunity to learn and increase my skill set, particularly recently when I've been invited to attend different forums and participate in other ways. It's been a positive challenge for me to step up, etc. Now, there's something here, I think, about valuing the relationship and how co-production can be an opportunity for personal growth. So the focus, I think, and what we're trying to do isn't just on what we can get from people to help our work. And the focus isn't just on what outputs we can get, for example, in terms of research papers. So what we're trying to do is value the impact of working co-productively rather than just the research findings or the research outputs in terms of papers. And again, and that I think is a real, real cultural shift. Now, the final principle um, is including all perspective and skills. So this is about making sure that you have everyone involved who should be involved. You know, who's going to be the end user of this, uh, which people or groups of people could add to this. Uh, and of course, we need to consider diversity and inclusivity uh, um, and all the things that you might need to ensure that people are to get involved. So here we've recognised, for example, that we need to include public members with a health and social care background. And so we are recruiting our new members. We've started developing a relationship uh, um, with um, black and Asian minority, I think minority uh, groups as well within the region. So hopefully some of those will come on board uh, um, as well, which would be really good. So we are sort of seeking to address these things. I need to more mention, I think, the importance of reflecting. So at the Research Design Service will be having standalone meetings to reflect and capture how well we are working to these principles. Uh, my idea was to have it um, as an item um, on our team agenda, but some of the public members quite rightly, I think, pointed out that if we do that, we're tacking onto an existing meeting, the time we have for reflecting will be squeezed because we know we have so much to cover um, in our work. So the idea is we're going to create a sort of safe space uh, away from uh, um, our usual team meetings. Uh, and we've got one of our public members who's going to uh, um, draw up, if you like, a, a simple uh, tool that will enable us um, to reflect because she's the one that's got the greatest experience in the team of working on co-production projects. So it, quite frankly, it makes sense for her to take a lead in that. And, and in that way, we're going to capture and reflect on um, our progression and indeed how we can improve. Just before I wrap up, I kind of, you know, want to mention if you like the wider environment because I'm very aware the things I've spoken about are very much about our very small team um, and this slide begins to capture some of my emerging thoughts and I want to share it with you and hopefully provoke a bit of thought because obviously our team doesn't operate in a vacuum you know there is a wider environment and a lot of the things that I spoke about I think fit uh, if you like at the micro level by which I mean um, our individual team but we also need to consider the MISO level, the wider organisation and the macro level, the wider environment. So at the MISO level, you know, we're talking about our organisations. I think we need our organisations, our universities to really embrace this idea of developing relationships with their localities, their stakeholders, whatever that might mean, because they might be global too. And embrace this idea, I think, of developing individuals, communities, you know, and I know that there are some um, uh, um, kind of shoot, you know, uh, green shoots on this, if you like, the Civic University Network, which very much has those aims in mind about developing strong relationships with community groups. Uh, and at a macro level, we need to create a research culture that doesn't just value research outputs, such as number of research papers, and whether or not they're in a high impact journal, etc. But some of the things I've mentioned here about increased confidence of people, new relationships, expanded social networks, you know, so I'm thinking, I guess, about things like the, the research excellence framework here and, and making sure that that reflects uh, um, a change in, the, if you like, the research environment. And, and I do think the trend is towards that. But of course, 
you know, these are things that are, are we know are inhibit outlet experiment uh, um, and working co-productively. So concluding comments then. So I'll give you a description of what we're trying to do. Hopefully there's a few little practical tips in, in our very early days that have come through, changing how we do meetings, stepping outside of roles, reflecting, moving from transactional relationships. Uh, but we can't ignore the wider environment and co-production with emphasis on sharing power and developing and valuing relationships isn't easy in an environment in which we focus, the focus is often on predetermined outputs and outcomes and measuring what it is we do and achieve. Uh, and so I do think we need to acknowledge that wider environment. And the wider environment combined with the flexibility, adaptability and compromise you have to engage in might mean that we can't always address the key principles and the features as well as we would like. But still, I still think we can use them as guidance uh, and we can use them as something to aspire to. And that's very much what we're trying to do in the research design service South East. So I think the key is to try and be transparent about what we're trying to do and what we're trying to achieve and reflect and record our journey and try and adjust and improve um, along the way. Um, so thank you very much for listening. Uh, and if there is time for any questions or comments, I'm more than happy um, to take. We, we're not not got time for questions now, Gary, but we have got time for questions um, at the end of the session. So in view of keeping us to time, I'm going to be a little bit brutal and suggest that because your your talk has generated loads of uh, comments in the conversation that we 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 reserve questions until after our next three speakers, if that's all right to you. And um, with with apologies to everyone for that, because um, there was rich content in there and some very interesting ideas. Ideas. Um, so um, the next session is going to be delivered by three uh, colleagues. So Rafia Badat, who's an expert on speech and language therapy, a clinician researcher, um, and an expert on uh, digital technologies and how to involve um, uh, public and private sector to explore how practitioners can work um, using digital um, technologies. And this was a, this was a, a something that obviously came up in our first um, uh, talk this morning. Um, uh, how the landscape is being changed in terms of uh, patients and public engagement by uh, digital technology. So uh, Rafia, a very, very warm welcome to you. And you, of course, um, are, have got some prestigious uh, research funding um, and you're an Alan Turing uh, Research uh, uh, Fellow, or if I've got the title right, and a you have a Digital Pioneer Fellowship. So very warm welcome to you. Duncan Barron is um, lead of our public and um, patient and public engagement team, and he works um, in our faculty to support researchers in meaningful engagement of patients and the public. And the, the, the word meaningful I think is important here and something of a theme uh, this morning, both in our comments and, and the questions which, which we've had. Um, and can, um, uh, is particularly involved in helping us getting NIH NOHR funding um, and um, and Duncan, a warm welcome to you. And finally, Samantha Wheeler, who's head of operations at Big Lemon, uh, which is a company which solves business problems with original creativity and clever technology. That's that's their um, uh, mission. Um, uh, a warm welcome to you, Samantha. So we have uh, 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 three different perspectives, um, Rafia, Duncan and Sam. Sorry, Samantha. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, can you hear and see me OK? Seems OK from this. You're end. coming through crystal clear. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I guess, yes, in the spirit of true collaboration, we're going to attempt to do a presentation with three of us together. So do please bear with us as we kind of try and navigate that. Um, I'll, I'll just start with um, just going over a bit more about who I am and my role. So I am a speech and language therapist. I've worked with the NHS for 15 years and I support children with language and learning needs. And in June last year, I was very, um, very fortunate um, and well, fortunate, but also as a result of a lot of hard work, was awarded an uh, NIHR Clinical Doctoral Research Fellowship and basically that funds my PhD research um, and it covers all costs of my research and training and my area of focus is supporting children with language disorder and of course I'm biased but I do feel that it is a very important area to focus research on. Um, not many people are aware that 10% of all children present with persistent long-term language difficulties. These are difficulties that without intervention they will not progress. So 
So if you think of a typical classroom, so in a typical classroom, there's 30 children. Three of those children re require specialist intervention and um, language disorder is more prevalent. So there's more children presenting with these needs than ADHD and ASD. So autism and AD attention deficit hyperactive disorder combined. Um, but quite often children mask their language needs with other behaviours. So sometimes emotional behavioural difficulties or physical difficulties. So um, it's an area where I, I feel that research is really important and thinking about inclusion. Um, I, I had a very quick look through the Power to the People document and I was pleased to see that language barrier is identified as a barrier to um, individuals becoming involved in research because I've seen that firsthand. Um, so that's just a bit of background of my research. So the focus of my research is very much to work with children with language disorder to create therapy tools for children with language disorder. So working as a clinician for 15 years, I'm fairly comfortable with being considered um, an expert in the field of language development. However, I'm not an expert in the lived experience of a child with a language disorder. And I want the children to tell me, whether it's verbally, whether it's through actions, whether it's through pictures, what they want as a therapy tool. So the idea is we work together to create a therapy tool. Um, so collaborating with children to create tools for children, but also a therapy tool will not work just in a, a, a kind of a university lab. <laughs> the idea is it's used in the real world with a range of professionals. So a lot of the support we offer is within schools because children spend a lot of the time in schools, so we make sure schools feel comfortable with supporting children and of course with parents and of course a lot of the children we support have other professionals involved as well so the idea is that we create this tool with the children but then we involve the key professionals and the parents and we don't do it at the end we create and support together all the way through so we have cycles of creation and once we've got to a stage where we have created what we feel all feel happy and comfortable with then we test it so we have this period of co-design followed by a period of more I guess old-fashioned clinical trials and that's the kind of um, approach that I have taken in this research so um, the first thing I did once I'd had this funding started up this project is really think about who I wanted to work with in terms of of this digital expertise. So definitely an area I'm developing in, but I am not a software developer. I'm a clinician and I'm very uh, confident and comfortable with that being my role. So I wanted to work with a digital team that shared this ethos of collaborative working. Um, and so I found out very, very randomly about um, NHS Hack Day. And anyone who doesn't know about it, it's basically um, something that's put together by an NHS clinician, Anne-Marie. Um, and she she decided to put together these days where clinicians are invited to bring a digital project and um, digital teams free up their time. They give their time for free to work with clinicians to problem solve together. I found about, out about this through Twitter, so through social media, which I think is such a great platform for finding out about events that you might not usually find out about or coming across people and institutions. And obviously social media has its pros and cons, but for me, this worked really successfully. So I have um, a five-year-old and a two-year-old and I live in London, literally got on the train with my five-year-old and um, traveled to Cardiff and they had crash, which thinking about inclusion, and accept, um, uh, uh, having a process where everyone can be involved in research. To me, having a, a crash was really important and so came along to this day, didn't know too much about it um, and met the most wonderful digital team called Big Lemon and Sam is head of operations. So what I'm going to do now is hand over to Sam, who's going to continue the story. Yeah, so we met um, Raffia who came with her idea, wanted to bring it to life using digital and tech. Um, we are quite experienced in the space as a company at hackathons. They're a fantastic opportunity for uh, industries to collaborate, to come together, to break down those boundaries and really um, work together in, in a short amount of time, 48 hours this one was over a weekend, and come up with a, a solution at the end of those 48 hours. So they're quite intense in how they run. And it was amazing at the end of the 48 hours, we we did produce a product. Um, we created the yeah, version of the app. Sorry, there's a bit, oh, there's a bit of noise in the background. <laughs> I'll keep going. Um, yep, yeah, so we created a first version of the app for Raffia called Wormwind. It was an interactive tool that 
point so we could use it, prototype it, um, and actually get people to, to play around with it as well. So it was an amazing achievement. And it's what we call a good product, actually an impact, impactful product that's been created um, and has meaningful impact. Over to you, Rafia. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so really exciting time. So I had my NIHR funding, um, had a digital team that I was really excited to work with because they really seem, seem to share this kind of ethos and importance of um, collaborative working. But what I was not an expert in was this whole process co-design. I really wanted to get um, into the whole theory and I wanted to be part of a network and feel, I wanted to learn from people already doing it basically. I, I wanted to kind of make sure I was approaching it in the correct way and so um, I am based at St George's Trust and I accessed some training that was um, available via the university so via the Centre for Public Engagement and the training uh, was co-led by Duncan and that's how I got to meet Duncan for the first time so I'm going to hand over to Duncan who's going to explain a bit more about the training and also kind of how our professional relationship developed from there so over to you Duncan. So yes, so the training Rafia is referring to is a, a masterclass that the Centre for Public Engagement put on last July and was led uh, by Dr Luca May Brady, who some of you may know, who's uh, an expert in uh, patient and public involvement and um, working with children and young people. So we were very uh, lucky to, to have the session uh, with her and uh, I gave some input as well. Um, and Luke May took us through um, the, the the importance of why uh, we need to uh, involve young people, um, the, the the importance of you know this issue of not doing research on and not doing it just on people, but the importance of actually involving people to get their voice heard. And we also touched on, amongst other things, uh, different approaches to uh, involving children and young people and there was a, a range of things we discussed and one of the 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 uh, contributions I was able to make to the masterclass was talking from uh, experience of setting up uh, a, a young people's advisory group uh, which is just one of the approaches that we we went through on the, at the masterclass but the YPAG was one we touched on in detail because it's one I've got first-hand experience and it's one uh, Gary's already referred to it in passing uh, through his uh, RDS slides. So this is a YPAG that was set up um, in about 2017, I think it was, um, and it's it covers Kent, Surrey and Sussex. It's run normally at the Children's Hospital at, uh, at Brighton. And we were very lucky at the masterclass to have two members join us, so Alexis and Kit are two um, members of the YPAG and they joined the masterclass to give their reflections of their experiences of being either involved as a participant in research, which was Kit's first-hand experience, and then Alexis, Alexis's uh, experience of being part of the YPAG. And in addition, they gave input and, and uh, detailed feedback to some of the attendees uh, and, and Rafia um, sort of was was inspired by this uh, this approach I think. Um, so I think I need the next slide sorry <laughs> getting out of sync as well. Um, after the um, Ah, so we're on the code of science. I wonder if we've gone ahead. Anyway, over to Rafia, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. So this is collaborative working in practice, right? <laughs> <Remote> collaboration. <laughs> um, so yeah, so the, the, the training was absolutely fantastic. There was a lot of theory that was covered, um, lots of professionals talking about how they involved um, the people who would benefit from the research in research, but actual uh, people who, young people who gave their experiences and there were, it was really powerful they talked about what mattered to them what they took out of research what things could
could be changed. And there was a lot of talk about the fact of um, it not being lip service and of there being a sustainable relationship. So it's not about engaging with um, a particular audience uh, to get what you need from this particular point in time and not thinking necessarily how it shapes the research as a whole. So for me, it was it was it was fantastic and really powerful. And that really helped me shape my first steering group. So I held my first steering group in February, I held it within a school, which for me was really, really important because as a clinician working for health, a lot of my collaboration is with the education system. So we held it within the school and that was the school from which the families and the children um, I was going to work with um, were based. So again, building trust and building that ongoing relationship. Um, and both Sam and Duncan were present at the steering group, um, as well as the special educational needs coordinator at the school um, and an educational psychologist and so lots of multidisciplinary working happening there. And what we did is really think about what do we need to put into place before we approach the children to ensure that it is done in a way that is respectful of the needs of the children, have an awareness of the other demands on the children's time. So whether it be educational, whether it be extracurricular activities, from a psychologist's point of view, what do we need to um, think about to ensure that children's well-being is placed at the centre? And I almost took a back step. I let others lead because I am immersed in this and I am quite subjective and I wanted to make sure that my, my kind of passion for the research didn't lead to me losing the, um, the kind of priorities for the children. So it was a really powerful experience and partly remote because Big Lemon are based in uh, Wales, so they joined remotely. So pre-lockdown, we were starting to get a sense of being able to work with people that were present in the space, but also pre people that were present remotely. Um, and so we had this wonderful session, made all this, uh, you can see the timeline there, made this kind of timeline of what we were going to do. Um, really great to hear Gary, um, who's talking about art and design. So we had a, a really amazing creative visual designer and you can see the colours and the way things have been used because we wanted to share the findings from the session with children and young people in a format and in a manner that was engaging for them. So we didn't want written minutes. <laughs> these were our minutes and these were the same minutes that we were going to share with the professionals and with NIHR themselves. So rather than us sending things one format to um, professionals and the funding bodies and then translating it for the children and young people, we did it the other way around. So we try to make it as accessible as possible for all, but in, in our minds, it was what would engage the children and young people. So we were up to this stage, had our timeline in place, and then along the same around the same time St George's University launched a champions project and it had lots of lovely overlaps with the work that we were doing and I'm going to hand over back to Duncan who's going to talk a bit more about that and how it linked together. Great thank you yes so this was it was very good timing really so it was a nice link to have uh, been able to link up with Rafia at the masterclass training that I mentioned briefly uh, to then actually collaborate on submitting a proposal to the St George's Engagement uh, Champions Programme and we were awarded a small amount of funding and in our proposal which was uh, we submitted that in about April one of our proposals was to engage with children and young people in a, in a virtual environment um, so but that was just one small element and then uh, obviously as we all know uh, lockdown came so um, that obviously had changed a lot, if not everybody's ways of working. But again, the timing was not too bad for the Champions Project in the sense that the YPAG that I also referred to uh, briefly a few minutes ago uh, in Kent, Surrey in Sussex, was planning, uh, and I helped facilitate this group, so uh, we were planning to run our first virtual meeting in June. Uh, and as a result, we were able to invo invite Rafia and Sam along to talk about the project. So this all dovetailed quite neatly uh, to enable Rafia to get some input on uh, the project and on the web, specifically the web design for the project. Yeah, and, and that process of actually delivering a session, a, a co-design session online was something quite new to us at Big Lemon, um, but a fantastic challenge and actually I feel we achieved far beyond expectations and we had to do a lot of thinking and a lot of planning and how it was going to be delivered. So the tools that were going to be used to deliver these sessions online were not familiar to us. So we had to do a lot of research around that and um, lots of practices 
um, in advance to make sure that we had every element covered in terms of um, any technical issues. Um, accessibility was a key thing for us as well. Um, so lots of things to consider when we were actually preparing it. Time was needed, more time to actually um, deliver the sessions and time to reflect and pull those findings together. And we found some great tools. So we use Zoom as a basic um, uh, calling mechanism for video calling. Not everyone was on screen, so we had to also think about that, not being visually present. Um, and we used a tool called Nearpod, which is actually a teacher's tool. And it's all contained in one space. So you can create the activities and they're interactive activities. So each individual in the session had an opportunity to engage with what was on the screen. They could write post-it notes and pin them on boards. They could circle images that they liked. They could um, engage in polls. Um, and it was all controlled by myself in the back end and anonymous to everybody else. So you couldn't see what people were saying. So it was very inclusive. No one was left behind. That was very important to us with there being young people. But we definitely underestimated their abilities. They flew through it and thoroughly enjoyed it. And actually wanted to hear more about what this is all about as a career as well, which was really interesting, we thought. Um, and we were hoping to show you a video of the lovely Christian. I don't think the video will load, um, but um, yeah, Christian um, was somebody who was engaged in the session and he said it was it was really fun, interesting meeting um, going from screens. Um, but yeah, the activities he thought were really fun. The, the screen element was the anomaly. So flicking from one screen to another to engage in the activities. Um, I think the video is trying to load, but um, yeah, I was hoping to just capture an image of him. But he was great. He was a lovely participant and gave us some great feedback. Uh, thank you, Sam. So really what the YPAG sessions, the Young People's Advisory Group um, remote session allowed us to do was trial out this way of remote co-design. And these young people were definitely, I'd say, experts in supporting research projects. So for me, it was a really good way of trialling out how this process works and trialling out remote, which was new for all of us. And the feedback we got was so powerful and really useful. And um, what we did was, so we run this um, session as a trial session with the YPAD group. Then we run the exact same session with a group of young people with language and learning needs. And we were able to translate it. We didn't have to make any changes to the process. So it shows that if there's good planning and design, it, it does translate translate over and I'm really pleased also to say that in terms of inclusion and diversity so we had a group of young people that had learning needs language needs and there was also a significant BAME representation not only with the group of young people with language needs but also the staff so the school staff facilitated the project and there was good representation there as well so thinking about inclusion and diversity that, that was in practice and real and there and happening which was fantastic um, so um, so we, we were kind of learning as we all were about this whole remote world, but able to put it into practice with two quite diverse groups, a group without additional language and learning needs and with experience of research, and then another group without experience of research and with additional needs, but we were able to use the same process. And so we were able to develop the website. Um, and um, this Monday, this coming Monday, we are going to run our next steering group remotely. And I'm so pleased to say that um, it's going to have a really good, again, good diversity of representation. So we've got a special educational needs coordinator from a school, a parent of a child with additional needs, um, a clinical academic, a professor of linguistics and communication, uh, Duncan, Sam and myself. And again, now we know that this process works, this is what we're going to do. We're going to use it. And then we are in the new year going to move on with the project. So the website, developing a research website uh, was a, a slight tangent. We used it just to um, develop our skills in this remote co-design world. And now what we're going to do is move on to develop the digital therapy. Um, you know, in my heart, I really wanted to do that in person. But actually, you have to look around and reflect at the situation and what's happening. And actually, it's much more likely that it's going to be remote. So the plan at the moment is if it's it's more appropriate to do it remotely we will do it remotely and if the opportunity comes to do it in person absolutely great but if not that's fine um so i guess the slide before just shows that we are able to show this process works with people from a range of backgrounds in terms of ethnicity in terms of language in terms of whether they are academics um, professionals parents or children so uh, still very new in learning this process of remote co-design but i think a lot of it is um, working together pooling ideas together, giving it a try and being very open and honest. Oh, we're going to do the best we can and we're going to learn as we go along together.
um, and then over to Sam. Yeah, just to finish up, I just wanted to share sort of an experience that we've continued on working this space thanks to um, Duncan for opening these doors. And we're doing a project with UCL Centre of Co-Production and Health Research, um, which is proving a fantastic project. And it just shows that um, these types of projects are really needed in this industry and breaking down those silos is really important um, and get, uh, bringing those skills together um, and matching to make sure that we're really delivering some long term impact. And like you say, really sharing power um, and yeah, I'd love to share any any sort of um, information around this project if anybody's interested further, but we just wanted to finish on that um, and just say a thank you as well for letting us share everything today.